Ubuntu 24.10 Oracular Oriole was recently released alongside GNOME 47 Denver, so let's take a look at their new features and improvements. Also join the Penguin by Discord community to be notified of announcements and uploads, ask questions, participate in polls and decisions, and chat with me and the community about Linux, tech, and other topics. Link in the description below. Let's talk about Nautilus, GNOME's file manager. Firstly, the sidebar has been completely reorganized with the Home, Recent, Starred, and Trash tabs pinned at the top, along with a new Network tab for connecting to remote servers that replaces the old Other Locations tab, but it no longer contains the root directory, which you now have to manually navigate to using the path bar. In my opinion, this change is for the better because it helps prevent new or less tech-savvy users from accidentally accessing or modifying core system components. The main folders like documents, music, pictures, videos, and downloads have been moved from the pinned locations section to the bookmarked folders section, which allows you to add and remove folders for quick access, including these main folders, and all remote servers, internal volumes, and disks are listed together in their own section below the bookmarked folders. Nautilus also got new compress and new folder dialogs that look more modern. Also, when searching in remote or unindexed locations, a new button will appear in the search bar notifying you of why searches may be slower or incomplete in those locations. The file picker has also now been integrated into Nautilus instead of being its own GTK file picker app, and since it's part of Nautilus, it looks and behaves much more like Nautilus and is much more consistent. For example, the sidebar locations and bookmarks are consistent, and so are the features and functionality, like changing the sort order, renaming and deleting files, manually entering a path into the path bar, faster and better search, and more. It also has a much more beautiful and modern design, which I really like. Firstly, Microsoft 365 integration with online accounts has been expanded to include email, calendar, and contacts. Next, a new accessibility option has been added in the pointing and clicking page, allowing you to enable focusing windows on hover, like in tiling window managers. This means moving the cursor over a window will automatically focus on that window. Also, when adding a keyboard layout, you can now preview a layout before adding it to your input sources. Next. Fractional scaling is now available and enabled by default on Fedora 41 and most likely other distros shipping GNOME 47 as well. Next, GNOME 47 finally supports accent colors, namely blue, which is the default, teal, green, yellow, orange, red, pink, purple, and gray. They affect apps and several elements throughout the shell, but they don't affect KDE or older GNOME apps. Not yet, at least, which is unfortunate. Hopefully this will be fixed in the next release. Accent colors also don't affect folder icons. Finally, along with the overall settings design being updated to the latest Libidwaita version, multiple settings panels have also been redesigned and modernized. Many descriptions about certain toggles and pages have been moved into little information icons on those toggles. Some new information has also been added throughout the settings app, usually in the form of information icons, and some toggles have been renamed. Also, some options that were grayed out when requiring a setting to be toggled on are instead hidden until you toggle that setting on. The volume levels dialog in the sound tab, the app notifications dialog in the notifications tab, and the search locations dialog in the search tab are all now their own pages instead of dialogs. Also, the options in the App Notifications page are more spaced out and organized for clarity, and the Search Locations page has a new bookmarked Locations section below the default locations. The Custom Locations section has also been simplified. In the Wi-Fi tab, the Connect to a Hidden Network dialog has been ported to Libadwaita. In the Sharing tab, the File Sharing dialog has been slightly redesigned and simplified, adding the File Sharing address and a button to open the Public folder. And finally, in the Accessibility tab, the Seeing page has been rearranged to move the Screen Reader option to the top, and the Cursor Size dialog has also been modernized. Epiphany's bookmarks have been massively redesigned with more beautiful and consistent looks. 
When you make a bookmark, you now get a larger, centered dialog, and the bookmark section is now a slide-over panel instead of a small list dialog. Next, a new Privacy Reports feature has been added, which displays which websites track you and how many trackers were blocked, and also the individual trackers themselves. Lastly, the ability to autofill forms has been added and can be enabled in the Privacy tab in Preferences. Also, unfortunately, Firefox Sync has been disabled because of changes to Firefox's account authentication process, and there is no set date for when it may return. Now, let's take a look at visual changes to the GNOME shell itself. Firstly, action dialogues in both the system and apps have been redesigned with a beautiful new floating design for buttons with nice rounded corners. The new dialog redesign is also more adaptive to different screen sizes. For example, the buttons will appear beside each other in normal windows, but will shift to being above and below each other on horizontally smaller windows, which is perfect for mobile devices. As for the buttons themselves, suggested action buttons will now take the solid action color you have selected, in my case green, while destructive action buttons are a transparent red, which not only looks pretty nice, especially compared to before, where they were just red text, but also won't be confused with suggested action buttons if, for example, your action color is red. And this red transparent look is now used for destructive buttons in general as well. Notifications also use the same floating style for action buttons now, which is cool. Dialogues are also slimmer in GNOME 47, and we see the introduction of the Adwaita Button Row widget, which is a new type of button often used under box lists instead of pill buttons. Next, GNOME 47 introduces proper UI scaling for smaller screens, meaning that app icons will scale properly instead of appearing tiny in the dash and app grid. This would have been so nice to have back when all I had was my 12-inch MacBook with Ubuntu. Next. GNOME 47 got a new, more modern looking loading spinner, which also affects the loading cursor. And it scales better in apps and dialogues, instead of looking too big or too small, which sometimes happened with the old spinner. Some apps like GNOME Software still use the old spinner, but that'll probably be fixed in GNOME 48. Next, the fun and playful pop effect for dialogues that was introduced in GNOME 46 has been ported to way more dialogues. GNOME 47 also got a beautiful new lock screen with a bold font for the time, and finally, generic legacy apps now get Libadwaita window decorations, making for a much more consistent experience overall. One change that didn't make it into GNOME 47 for some reason is the font switching to Inter, so we'll probably see this change in GNOME 48. Next, let's take a look at GNOME 47's under the hood changes and improvements. Screencasts are now hardware accelerated by default on Intel and AMD GPUs, meaning GNOME uses your GPU for screencasting. This generally results in smoother and higher quality screencasts and reduces strain on your CPU and resources, resulting in better performance. Hardware accelerated screencasts also use MP4 instead of WebM. GTK rendering is now faster and more accurate, resulting in a smoother and more consistent experience, especially on older hardware. GNOME is now independent of the deprecated Xorg display server, meaning it can be compiled with Wayland only, as is done in Fedora 41. This doesn't mean GNOME has dropped support for Xorg. You can still use it if you'd like, and many distros like Ubuntu still compile GNOME with Xorg by default, and will for the foreseeable future, but GNOME no longer requires it to function. When logged into a remote GNOME session, getting disconnected from that session won't end it, allowing you to log back in and continue your work. Overall, GNOME 47 is a pretty big release compared to the previous releases, and definitely a great one. Now let's move on to the release of Ubuntu 24.10, Oracular Oriole. Ubuntu's 20th anniversary release includes several easter eggs as well as great new features and improvements. Let's get into it. Firstly, Ubuntu has a new security center that is currently very limited as it only lets you manage app permissions but plans to incorporate firewall, encryption, and Ubuntu Pro settings. And who knows, maybe the security center can get anti-malware capabilities in the future. 
Speaking of permission management, experimental permission dialogues can be enabled in the Security Center. If enabled, they will appear when a program needs to read and write to a file or directory within your home directory and its permissions have not yet been confirmed, for example when you're saving a file for the first time in Firefox. Also, these dialogues give you a large set of options. You can temporarily or permanently allow or deny the program to write, read, and or execute files, and you can decide which files, file types, and directories the program can write to and access. These permissions can also be reverted in the Security Center. The Yaru app theme has been updated to be more consistent with the newest Labaduita, for example, using the split sidebar and content design that was introduced in GNOME 45 with Labaduita 1.4. It still does not look 100% like Labaduita, for example, the spacing between both sides of selected tabs and sidebars is wider, the colors and overall theme is also slightly different looking, and buttons have a completely different design, and honestly, Ubuntu should just switch to proper Libertuita. I'm not sure why they use their own theme that looks similar but not the same, as it causes inconsistency in theming, but at least Yaru apps look nice and they blend in fairly well. While most Ubuntu-specific programs like the App Center, Security Center, Permissions Dialog, and Subiquity Installer use the modern design, the firmware updater app hasn't gotten it yet, so hopefully that is fixed in Ubuntu 25.04. Moving on to other UI changes, menus for apps in the dock now show the app's name at the top and a flatpak like app details button has been added for snaps, which shows the app's info page in the app center when clicked, like with flatpaks. Next, Ubuntu has added some 20th anniversary easter eggs in a few areas. Firstly, the boot screen has a new Ubuntu 20th anniversary logo, along with the about page and settings, which is a nice touch. Next. Two new 20th anniversary wallpapers have been added, including a 20th anniversary remake of the original Ubuntu 4.10 wallpaper, which is my personal favorite, and a wallpaper showing Ubuntu's logo evolution over the years. Next, a new theme has been added, which can be discovered if you select the new Warty Brown accent color that changes your top bar to white since it used to be white back then, and adds a beautiful gray theme to your Lebedwaita apps and system shell for a nostalgic feel. And finally, Ubuntu 4.10's beautiful boot sound has been added in Ubuntu 24.10. Which is an awesome touch in my opinion, but can always be disabled in the settings if you dislike it. Firstly, if you download a deb file from the internet, you can now open it in the App Center by double-clicking it. A warning will appear telling you that the app may be dangerous, as well as any information the deb file may contain, and you can install the deb file without any issues, which is a great change for user experience. Next, the App Center has added an uninstall option for apps in the Manage tab, so you no longer need to navigate to the app's info page to uninstall the app. Next, when updating an app, if the app is pinned to the dock, the app icon will now gray out and display a progress bar instead of disappearing from the dock and then reappearing when the update finishes. Finally, the App Center has received better touchscreen support, which should make navigating it easier for tablet or mobile users. Ubuntu now ships with a system profiler out of the box by default called SysProf, which is great for developers to find performance optimizations and bottlenecks for their apps, but not very useful to the regular end user. Ubuntu 24.10 selects Wayland by default at login, even for NVIDIA users. Which is a step in the right direction, as the latest NVIDIA drivers are improving support for Wayland and Linux in general and we will not be able to continue relying on the deprecated, outdated, obsolete, and extremely insecure Xorg display server for much longer. Also, if your NVIDIA GPU doesn't work very well on Wayland, you can always fall back to Xorg in the login menu. Moving on to other changes, Ubuntu interim releases starting with 24.10 will now ship with the latest and greatest Linux kernel by default, in this case, 6.11. Ubuntu 24.10 also comes with GNOME 47 and all of its changes, and App 3, which comes with a clearer and more organized layout. 
overall, this is a great feature packed Ubuntu release that I actually installed in the middle of producing this video and I'm loving so far. Also, congratulations to Ubuntu for being around 20 years and revolutionizing the Linux desktop. Here's to another 20 years of Linux innovation. Subscribe if you like my content and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you really like my work and want to support me, I have a Penguin Byte channel membership with two tiers. The King Penguin tier, which gives you a Penguin Byte badge next to your username, access to exclusive emojis, and priority reply to comments, and an Emperor Penguin tier, which gives you everything in the King Penguin tier, plus shoutouts, members only content, VIP Discord access, and more. Check them out by clicking the join button below. Thank you to my YouTube members for supporting my work and all of you guys for being part of the community. And thanks for watching. See you next time.